Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from Nam, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Um, today we're going to be talking about storing and disposing of toxic household cleaners with my guest, uh, David. Um, but before we get going, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm David Speller. I work with Sustainability Victoria here in Melbourne and run a program called Detox Your Home, which is one where we collect household chemicals and, and make sure they're safely managed and disposed of. So the things that people have sitting in their sheds, we take those away and, and look after them. Yes, I certainly have quite a few things just lurking in the back of my kitchen cupboard. Um, but before we get going, um, we'll do a little segment we like to call Have You Met David? Um, so that's where we introduce you. So what's your favourite book? Now that's a really hard question. Always when people say what's the favourite thing, um, I often have whatever the, the thing is I've read lately is probably, probably my favourite at the moment, but then there's a few other things that crop up. So. And often things that I think is my favourite book, I go back and reread it and think, yeah, that's a really interesting book, but I don't want to read a second time because there's other books out there. But um, one that does stick in my mind at the moment is um, a book called Uncle Tungsten, which is written by Oliver Sacks. And it's really the story of his uncle who he grew up around and who was a, a mad chemist who just loved chemicals. And so Oliver Sacks, through that, learned a lot about chemistry and about um, what happens when you mix a whole lot of chemicals together. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it was disastrous, but a fascinating book. And very relevant to the topic today. Absolutely, yep. Mm. Um, I've actually got that book. I just need to get around to reading it. So I'll put that on my list for the next one. Um, is there a movie you've seen recently or a TV show? Um, again, it's the same. Uh, what's your favourite movie? There's so many to choose from. And um, most of them don't stick around for long anymore. Movies come and go and you can't find them for a while. But um, probably the best one I've seen recently is Belfast by Kenneth Branagh. An amazing story of a young boy growing up in, in Ireland during the war. It's quite a raw sort of documentary but well not really documentary but a raw movie but it's yeah fantastic and, and worth having a watch yeah yeah definitely i'll um, check that out as well um any podcast you're listening to uh again another hard one um probably the one i'm listening to most at the moment is called strong songs by kurt hamilton it's um one that really just often it's based on readers questions like that he'll look at a certain piece of music or a range of music and really analyze how that was created and some of the the, the detail behind it or the theory behind it um so it's good just to know more about Sometimes just the, the song in general or the, the piece of music, but also a lot of the, the music theory underlining it too and, and just understanding how some of those things were created or why it is that those songs work. Is there a particular song that you remember um, recently that you listened to? Um, from that, uh, probably the, the most interesting one recently was uh, The Wichita, Wichita Line Man. And uh, for those who know it, it's a Glen Campbell song and it turns out that he was just part of a studio band and they got some words and he quickly pulled it together as... as the song as part of a demo and he sort of took off his oh. career grew from there as well and but just uh, some of the detail about how that song was written and um yeah it's a, the whole the whole program is fascinating and a lot of those songs do come up and you think wow i've never really listened to that so closely or listened to that particular horn solo in there or something like that so it's worth having a listen to definitely but the other one that i've been listening to a long time too is um this american life which um Sadly, I started my radio career about the same time as This American Life. Um, nothing I've done has taken off quite so successfully in terms of my radio programs. But uh, Maybe this that, one will do it. I hope so, yes. I've got my fingers crossed. But um, Yeah, so that's certainly, that's certainly two really good podcasts that really have value in terms of going back to them again and again and getting really good content rather than thinking, oh, I've heard that sort of idea so many times now. And often you'll move on from one podcast to another. But um, mm. yeah, certainly those two. Yeah, there's quite a few that I've listened to again because they're so interesting and quite a few have been turned into like documentaries or films which I find so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Or solve real murders and real murder Exactly. Cases, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a role model? Again, that's a quite an interesting question. Like there are role models or people who I've um, really respect in terms of the work they've done, like people like David Bellamy or David Suzuki, um, especially around the, the uh, marine environment and environmental work they've done. But 
then I think about there's a lot of people who live close to me who probably nobody else has heard of, like a friend of mine. Um, uh, she's a, a very keen diver. I recently went to her 80th birthday on Tuesday night, and on Wednesday we're out scuba diving. And I thought, wow, if I can do that when I turn 80, I'll be really happy. And so just seeing people like that around me who are doing amazing things that they think is just ordinary everyday life, then they're quite good role models as well, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I definitely want to be one of those active 80-year-olds who everyone thinks that they're just keep going that'd be that'd be great absolutely this woman even in her late 70s thought it was time to go to the antarctic and dive under the ice i think wow imagine that <laughs> so she got trained and got all the right gear and went to the antarctic and dived under the ice and it just God. blows me away that you can still do that it's those things in your, your 70s and 80s and i know i don't even think i can do it now <laughs> apparently it's not too late <laughs> okay great i'll get started yes um have you completed a course um like a favorite course um Probably the, one of the ones that influenced me most was a, um, actually a master's course in social ecology that was run through the University of Western Sydney, which um, like I did all science degrees and uh, started doing a lot of work around environmental management. And um, a lot of people said, you've got to go and do this course, go to Western Sydney and do social ecology, which turned out when you started, you could choose it to be either a science or an arts degree, um, depending on which, which path you followed. But um, it was run by a someone who was actually uh, initially a vet who then became a psychologist and um, worked a lot with the agricultural college to help fa help them change farming practices. And then it broadened out into just general social ecology, like how do you bring about change or how do you work with complex issues? And uh, it's a course where on the first day they asked everybody where they're from. There was a policeman, there was a postman, there was a tax agent, there was a couple of teachers, a social worker, like so many different groups all coming together to learn from each other about how you work with people. That's great. So what is social ecology? Well, it's really pretty much as it says, it's the ecology of society, like how do, how do, how do groups work or how do people work and um, just learning about ways to, to understand or work more effectively with whether it's whether you want to be an activist or you're really wanting to uh, just work with groups or just in, say, for example, the work I do where you're working with communities to get people to manage hazardous waste properly, like how do you do that and how do you work with all those broad sectors of the community and get them to come together. So it's, it's really about thinking about society and how it works and how you can work with it effectively. Yeah, I never thought that that would, of course, it, I mean, it makes sense completely um, that you would need those skills, but I just never th thought that you, I never thought it would exist, I guess. I guess everything exists now. Oh, it does, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was quite an amazing course, yeah, certainly. Mm. Um, with, I think it's still running. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, we'll have to look up. Not sure if I have time to do it now, but maybe That's when okay, I'm yeah, 80. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're not learning to dive or something else. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so how would you define household management? Well, I think it's pretty much as it says, like you, how you manage your household, whether whether you're part of a family or whether it's just your own house. Um, we all live somewhere and we all make choices about how we, how we live in that space and both what we do in that space, but also what we bring into it. So it's, it's really thinking about... In a lot of ways about the space you create and how you live in that and how you, how you manage that so that it's good for you and good for the people around you and often good for the for broader society as well if you think more broadly about when you buy something all the impacts those choices have yeah i can't i don't think we can really do anything nowadays that doesn't have well maybe not we've always everything we do has always had an impact on someone else i guess yeah well yeah. some of them have impacts further because like even COVID, if we weren't flying around the world so much, it probably wouldn't have been an issue. It would have stayed in one place. But because we've got the power to move things around, you can you can go to the shop and you can buy buy a can of pineapple and not even think about how far that's come from or what's actually gone into creating that. But often there's so much more energy because we can bring it from other parts of the world and bring all these things together that in the old days you would have just eaten locally because you couldn't travel more than 20 or 30 k's to buy your food. Yeah, you'd only get to eat pineapple whenever you... Went to Queensland. Went to yeah. Queensland, exactly. <laughs> so there would only be Hawaiian pizzas in Queensland. Oh, oh no, the devastation. <laughs> I like pineapple pizza. Yeah. So really, yeah, that's what I think household management mm -hmm. is about, how you how you manage where you live and, and often how you live in that space, yeah. Mm. What do you think people get wrong? Um, I think it's often that lack of, lack of awareness or lack of forethought about when I buy something, what does that mean? Um, like even just uh, like we've got the plastic bag ban in, in Victoria at the moment because uh, so much was done in terms of people just going and buying plastic items and not thinking about the, the impact of those. So when you buy a plastic bag, you put it in the bin, 
the garbage truck comes, empties a bin, that blows away and ends up somewhere else. And mm. so a lot of those things, they seem really convenient at the time, but there are a lot of impacts that come because of that choice that rather than taking my own bag to the supermarket, I'll get a bag there and take it home and you know, just add to that whole cycle of having more and more disposable plastic. Yeah, yeah, I definitely remember as a kid, my parents just had these bags of plastic bags and nowadays I barely have any um, and I hoard them so carefully. <laughs> Because, um, you know, sometimes you need to wrap something in plastic so it doesn't yeah. spill everywhere. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely not as big a, of, a, of an issue for me, I guess, having yeah. to store them. Whereas I remember my mother, like, often come home, there'd be all these plastic bags hanging on the line because she wouldn't buy many, but she'd always reuse them and wash them and hang them on the clothesline and dry them. And the clothesline was an amazing place where a lot of things would happen there, like hang there, those things there, dry the clothes, of course. Um, one day she was... She had a chicken she wanted to thaw in a hurry, so she hung that on the clothesline in the sun. She forgot about it, spun the clothesline around, hit herself in the back of the head. <laughs> oh, no. So, yeah, things like that were quite funny in our background, but certainly plastic bags on the clothesline were just part of growing up because you never knew when you're going to need another one, and you always keep what you've got. So. I never thought about washing them and, like, drying them on, a, like, a washing line. That's a great idea. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit too lazy for that. I have to, <laughs> I have to implement it, though. Um, so what is home safety? I get to think, again, it's part of your, your household management about thinking about what you're doing and how, whether it creates any, any unsafe aspects. Like you, if you leave things just sitting on the floor where you can trip over them in the night, then you're going to have an accident. Um, but also some of the, the products we buy can be unsafe in terms of, like often if someone sees a rat or a mouse, they go, oh, I've got to get some rat sack, I'll kill it. and They'll buy a whole box of rat poison, they'll put it out all over the place. The cat or the dog might eat some of it, the, the toddler might crawl around and eat some of it. Like, There's all sorts of things that can happen if you don't manage that stuff properly, but you may actually catch a rat and go, oh, I've got all this left over, you put it in the shed, and it can then sit there for ages and, again, some other possible accident or something like that. So it's really about when you do buy things, thinking about how you manage them when you've got them and mm -hmm. how you also dispose them later on or how you manage them once you've finished with, with what you've had there. Um, Mm -hmm. So, with rat poison, um, do you think it's necessary to buy that type of thing? Um, depends on whether you like rats or not. Um, <laughs> often, it's, often people say you've got rats because of other things that are happening in your property, whether you've got um, food sitting around the house or sometimes a badly managed compost heap can attract those. So you need to look at mm -hmm. what's actually attracting those rats or whether whether you can actually stop them by looking at how they're getting to the house and sealing up those places or, um, yeah, those, those sort of things can be a way of managing it. And um, there are different ways of, of catching rats too. Like you can use a trap and take them somewhere else, put them in someone else's property. But uh, <laughs> there's a, yeah, it, it, rat poison is one one approach that people mm -hmm. do choose and it's at least a pretty nasty, horrible mm. death for the rat. So it's not something yeah. you necessarily want to be part of. So yeah. it's, you've got to think about whether that's the best solution for the rats you've got or whether there's other ways of managing the problem or whether you can just accept that we live we live in, in society, there are animals everywhere and probably most of us have a rat living somewhere nearby or, or foxes or something like that, but um, it's more whether they're getting into your house and, and how you feel about that that mm. is the issue. And if they're eating your food. Exactly, yeah. You shouldn't leave yeah. the food out, it should be in the cupboard. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, um, but if you do decide to use rat poison, like how how should you, you know, any tips for using it or for storing it? Well, probably the main thing is to follow the instructions on the packet because there's so many different types out there but mm. also to think about wherever you put it what else can get access to that is it going to be um like will children or pets get access to it or even even other other animals it's going to be put somewhere where birds may think that's bird seed and, and eat it so it's, you've got to think about how you make sure it's just available for, for the target animal you're looking at mm. so it's really about thinking broadly how you how you how you're using it but then when you store it mm -hmm. Like, why did, why did you buy so much in the first place? Did you need that much? And um, secondly, is it safe where you're storing it? Or is, it gonna, um, is the packet going to break apart and fall into other things? Or is it going to have any other impact on anything else? Yeah. Mm. Um, so how does home safety affect household management? Or how does household management affect home safety? Well, it's really about thinking all, of all those things that you do. Like, how, yeah. do, how, does, how do you buy things in a way that's going to be safe? Um, like when you when you do buy, say you buy some cleaning products, often we'll buy the, the 10 litre or the 20 litre because it's cheaper and um, that thing sits there for ages and it's 
it can be unsafe just because of the nature of the product or if it's um you, when you're finished with it what do you or if you've you've used your five liters out of your 20 liter bottle what do you do with the rest of it um you mm-hmm. can't put it in the bin so you've either got to find some way to safely dispose of it but um a lot of people if you talk to them they go oh just dig a hole in the backyard and i'll pour it in the air or something <laughs> like that which means it's gone mm-hmm. at the moment but it'll seep into the waterways or it'll stay there and when you plant something on top of that it'll affect your plants that's yeah it can kill the worms it can do but and we want the worms so, yeah so it can it can have a lot of different impacts in terms mm-hmm. of how you decide to manage it so mm-hmm. probably again coming back to health household safety you think about when you're buying something how much do you need yep and if you do buy it and you don't use it or what are you going to do with it next like is there a way to safely dispose of it or mm-hmm. Are you going to be stuck with this thing in your shed that you leave it there until you move and someone else moves in and they go, there's all this stuff in the shed, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> it's a really common problem for new tenants moving into a place. You know, really? There's all this paint, there's all this, there's bottles, I don't even know what they are, it's not labelled, the label's fallen off. And so mm. people do often move out of a house and just leave things behind that they didn't know how to dispose of and then the new tenant has to work it out. Very nice. <laughs> exactly. So what are some like common ones? You've mentioned rat poison, like some cleaning products. Um, what are some common ones that we have in the house? Um, probably one of the most common things we collect through Detox Your Home are, are flammable liquids like um, uh, terps and um, kerosene and things like that, things that people have bought for some particular reason and then they've used a bit or even they may have a couple of cans of petrol for the lawnmower that they use once a year. and. Uh, so there's a lot of things that a lot, of, a lot of flammable materials that people buy that they don't always use and then um, there's no safe way of disposing of that but also other things we get a lot we get a lot of pesticides and herbicides so whether it's your um, weed and feed spray for the lawn or whether it's something really toxic for killing a particular a tree or a bug um, we get a lot of those that really common items that we get but also um, we got a lot of weird stuff too like a recent event I was at Someone brought in a really rusty old can with DDT written on top of it and a, a jar in a bag that said strychnine, which is a really horrible poison. Uh, there's a lot of things that people have that they've got no way of getting rid of those either. So, mm-hmm. so some of those unusual things, but also the most common things are things like those fuels and the pesticides and herbicides and mm-hmm. a lot of some cleaning products like bleach and things like that that you don't really want to spill on in, in the wrong place. But um, Again, we buy a large bottle and have it sitting in the laundry just in case we need it because yes. we need a capful for today. And <laughs> I have, um, we had a bit of mold in our bathroom when we first moved in. So I bought, you know, the smallest possible container of mold killer, which was far, far more than I needed. Um, and now it's just been sitting in my bathroom for three years. Um, and sort of the same with like, you know, grout cleaner and oven cleaner that I don't really use very often. Um, is it dangerous just to leave it like lying around? Oh, they can be. Um, like a lot of these, com- a lot of these, these substances, um, often they're okay just sitting in a bottle in the corner, and if if it's just, if that's all it's doing. But um, like you got to think, what happens if, if it spills? Is it going to get onto some clothes? If it's say you bleach and you're going to bleach accidentally your clothes, or is it going to um, spill when a friend's visiting with one of the a toddler who's crawling around and, and puts their hands in it, or thinks, oh, this looks nice, and is that a lemonade bottle with stuff in it? I'll drink that, and um, so it can be poisonous in that way, or some chemicals, when they mix together, when they shouldn't, can actually be quite damaging too in terms of either being explosive or uh, just being becoming highly corrosive and things like that. So it's best not to have things where they can accidentally mix together with other things that aren't meant mm. to go together. So it's so should you store your chemicals in separate areas or should you just make sure that they've got a really good cap on them? Uh, it's probably best to make sure that that first of all, the containers are solid. That it's, if you, often a plastic bag, sorry, a plastic bottle becomes quite brittle after a while. So mm. you might move it and it just breaks open. Um, so as long as the bottle's quite solid and the cap's on properly and it's in a place where it's not likely to be hit or bumped or damaged by anything else, mm-hmm. then it should be reasonably safe for a while. But again, you need to keep an eye on it and often think about what happens if it does spill. Because mm-hmm. when it's in the laundry, just in the bottom cupboard, when it spills, it can go right across the floor. Or sometimes it's safer to have a small plastic tray or something like that that things sit in so that if they do break at least it'll be contained a certain amount but then you've got to worry about all the other things that are in that plastic tray as well so how are they going to mix together do these things tend to have like expiry dates that you need to keep an eye on some do and some don't but then, and then some of these things um like they're fairly stable they stay the same throughout their life they're not mm. going to be um become a different product or break down necessarily and they can be used for a long time whereas other things do do change their nature, but a lot of things just have a use-by date because 
the manufacturer is required to put on that, whether it's going to break down or not. Um, but again, you should, just because you can keep something for five years because it's safe on the bottle doesn't mean you need to have it in your house for five years. You mm. can say, right, I've finished with that. I don't need any more. I can safely get rid of it somewhere or move it on somewhere or, or even find out if somebody else actually needs some of this right now and I can swap it or give it to them, yeah. So... Do you know how, is there like, are there groups where people sort of post what cleaning materials they have or is it more just asking around some friends? No, I don't know. Of. Like I know that um, in my, my neighbourhood there's a, a Facebook page called Zero Waste Westies and like if anybody's got anything they don't want that they may want to give away, they go, look, I've got this half a bottle of bleach, does anybody want it? And somebody else goes, oh, yeah, I was going to buy some of that, I'll have it. And so there's a lot of exchanges go on because people do find that they've got something that they don't want anymore but somebody else wants it and doesn't want to buy the whole bottle so it's probably more those those community groups can be useful but um yeah some things that you just there's nobody's going to want the thing that you've used three quarters of the bottle and it's sitting there and you just got to find some way to safely get rid of it mm. or use it up yeah. so um yeah what's how do you safely get rid of um a lot of these materials um a lot of things, it's, again, that's where you need to think about when you're buying something. A lot of things, there isn't a simple solution to it. There are some products that are there are really good programs for. Say, if you buy a paint, whenever you buy a paint, 15 cents a litre actually goes to a program called Paint Back where you can actually go and drop all of the leftover paint at one of the Paint Back drop-off sites and they'll take it away for you for free and uh, safely either um, find a way to reuse that in some way or dispose of it safely. So that's that's one, one thing out there. There's also... Um, a new program that's just starting up called B-Cycle for battery recycling, which again, it's funded by industry. So again, so it's getting the industry who's created the problem to, to manage it partly. So B-Cycle gets funding from industry to cover the cost of transporting and recycling batteries so that the, the raw materials inside those batteries can be reused again. So there's a few programs like that, but a lot of other things. Like if you buy, if you buy some petrol for your lawnmower, you leave it sitting in your shed for two years, it's probably not going to be very good for your lawnmower because petrol starts to break down. And you can't can't pour it somewhere. You can't put it in the bin. You don't want to put it in your car because um, it'll probably be bad for your car engine too. So that's where things like the detox your home events are worth having a look out for because you can bring those to to us where you drop them off and they're taken away. And a group of chemists work out what all the all the contents are in the unlabeled bottles and and work out how they can manage that safely. And some of it's some of it can be reused. Some of it has to be disposed of to landfill if it's made safe. And some of them like really strong acids and really strong alkalines can be mixed together to make a neutral solution, which then can go through um, industrial waste to the sewage station. Whereas if either one of those went down on their own, they'd be quite toxic. So that's where the, the chemists are able to manage those. Or flammable liquids can be used as a fuel. So for example, um, there are uh, some aluminium smelters and some uh, cement kilns actually use things like old paint and old flammable liquids for the fuel for their kiln rather than using electricity or gas. So. So some of those things go to those sort of users. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm. Um, is that better for the environment that we burn it um, for fuel or? Well, often it's a matter of we burn that or we burn coal or something okay. like that. Um, mm -hmm. And with a, with a well set up kiln, it burns at such a high temperature that there's almost nothing left, like no smoke or produced and things like that, which we often tend to think if we burn something like coal, the smoke comes out of the chimney. But even that can be done a lot more safely. It's not It's not ideal because it is creating greenhouse gases, but... If the choice is you're going to pour all the stuff into landfill and it's getting in the water, waterways, mm -hmm. or you burn it completely so there's very little left, it's often the, the better approach, yeah. So I, f I think that, you know, um, some people would think that the easiest way to get rid of some of these, particularly, li particularly the liquids, is to just pour it down the drain or, you know, for maybe some, like, you know, pellet-type things to put them in the bin. Is um, I'm guessing that's not okay, what depends happens? On, depends on when you think about what happens when something goes down the drain because mm -hmm. often we just see, oh, there's a drain, we'll pour something down there, it's okay. And mm -hmm. not everybody even understands the difference between a stormwater drain and the sewer because um, whatever goes down the stormwater, like if you pour something down the gutter on the footpath, it goes down the stormwater drain, which means it goes down a pipe into the nearest creek or into the bay or something like that. So it ends up, you think, oh, it's gone, I've poured it down the drain, but then tomorrow you're swimming in it down at the beach, that's... So you need to know that that's what happens if it goes down a stormwater drain. So even when people just wash their car on the on the road, on the side of the road, it all goes straight down into the bay or things like that. Um, or if you pour it down, again, the sewage, people think the toilet is the sewer, but 
if you pour it down the kitchen sink or down the laundry sink or any any sink in your house, as well as the toilets, it all goes down to the sewage treatment station where it's actually treated. So, so again, those things can be managed when they get there. But again, it's not not ideal to be pouring a lot of some of these things down the sink because, especially things like any, any sort of flammable liquids, that you don't know what's going to happen when it's going down the pipe or um, mm. what fumes will come out of your your sink. Or oh, really? So it's not ideal to just pour things down the drain. Yeah, and uh, also if it goes to landfill. Like it might be in a box at the moment, but once it gets goes into the the truck and the compactor breaks it down, or it gets to the tip, it tip and the um, bulldozer runs over or something, it's in an open package. Which, if it's raining, all that rat sack or whatever it is will go into the waterways and into mm-hmm. the environment. So it's the aim is for it ultimately not to end up in the environment. So if you can keep it out of out of the drains as much as possible and, and find some other way to to manage it is ideal. Mm. I also saw that a lot of pharmacies take medications and things. Yeah, they do, they do, yeah, which is great because, yeah, a lot, a lot of medication people get, they take half the bottle of tablets, they go, oh, I feel much better now. And they'll have it sitting there for years and they go, oh, I want to get rid of this. So, you, yeah, they, do you put it down the sink? Do you put it in the bin or do you take it back to the pharmacy? And they will take a lot of those and, and um, make sure that they get managed safely in some ways too, whether it's to go back and be destroyed somewhere or managed in some other way, yeah. Yeah, I believe they get destroyed, so probably set on fire or something. Yeah, or just crushed into a fine powder mm. and... Yeah, um, that's good because I think everyone has like just, you know, you've taken some antibiotics and then you find out it's not a bacterial infection, so you stop taking them. And then what do you do with it um, afterwards? Um, so I think, yeah, knowing you can take it to the pharmacy is really good. Um, what other things um, can you, um, you know, what other things um, should we dispose of carefully? Um, there's a lot of things like, again, if you'd have, have a look around, look look around your, your laundry and your kitchen cupboards and your shed and see the th- sort of things that are stored there that have been there for a long time that you've probably got them there because you're not sure what to do with it or you've only half used it. Um, there's a lot, a lot of things. Um, car care products are quite common. Um, things like um, car waxes, car polishes, um, armor oil and things, things that people get. Often, um, often some of the stuff we get, there'll be a few unopened cans of car wax or car polish and when you talk to the person, they go, oh, I get this every year from my kids and I, I don't even, I never polish the car. So it's the sort of thing that maybe you've received as a present or have for some reason that you've been given or you bought thinking you're going to clean the car, but you haven't. Um, so those are quite common things. Um, cosmetics too, like um, a lot of cosmetics, even uh, nail polish and things like that, uh, it's, they're acetone based and stuff. They shouldn't ideally end up in the landfill either. So and again, it's one of those things you talk to someone, they go, oh, I've got about 50 bottles of old nail polish sitting at home, but I don't know what to do with it. Or I might use it one day, whereas often it's just sitting there for years on end. And again, that's the sort of thing we do accept because it can be processed as well. So yeah, there's such a wide range of things that we do, do end up with people bringing to us in terms of um, pool chemicals, things like old um, chlorine and stuff like that that you may have used for your pool. Um, yeah, gardening products, a lot of different fertilizers and compost and things, or not compost, but... Um, <laughs> Because that could just go in the people. garden. Some of, some of it can go in the garden, but sometimes people have had this bottle of something for years and they're not quite sure what it is. And we do get a lot of things where we ask people to write unknown if they don't know what it is so that we know that it has to be managed well. But um, uh-huh. things that people, again, may have moved into a house and it's been there forever and they go, it's a lemonade bottle full of something clear and I don't know what it is. I don't want to open it. And so they bring it to us and we will have a look and find out what it is. Um, is it ever water? Sometimes. <laughs> But often it's things like, um, or just, just maybe meth or something like that, or um, kerosene or something that's, at that time it was a clear liquid. Or, mm. But um, yeah, things like petrol too, like do people have petrol, uh, motor oil, a lot of stuff like that. That Yeah, and that, that sounds dangerous to just have in the house. Because what if there's a house fire, I guess? Well, that's the thing, like um, just about the last two years, um, in two years we've collected 68 tonnes of, of flammable liquids. It is a lot when you think about... Um, in any area that's, say, bushfire prone, or if you do have a house fire, everything you've got that is flammable just adds to the, the risk of that, that fire becoming quite a serious incident. So keeping those there can be quite a problem. Or, um, and again, it depends on how it's stored or what it's stored near. Um, things like batteries are known to create sparks or to cause, um, mm. cause possible fires, but when you've got your batteries and your, all your chemicals stored in the same place, it creates a, quite a, a dangerous scenario too. So, so a lot of those things, depending on how you store them, are dangerous, but also depending on what else happens. Like if you do have a fire and you've got a whole lot of 
flammable stuff in your shed, which is right next to your house, then you just add it to, to the mix, really, yeah. Mm. Um, so you said that batteries can cause sparks, so you don't want them to be near to um, anything flammable. Is there anything else like that, you know, that you don't want to store two things together or you want to store some things in a specific way? Um, a lot of them it's about thinking about how they are stored and what will happen if they if you, something does spill. Um, like one of the things to think about is if you've got liquids, say pesticides or liquid herbicides or things, if you put them on the top shelf in your shed and you've got all your other things underneath, all the, the rat sack and everything else, if the bottle does break down and open, all the, the liquid will flow down and may flow into the things below it. Um, so anything that's likely to, to leak, probably put that at the bottom of all the mm -hmm. things you're storing and put sort of dry things above that so they're less likely to, to mix or less likely to have some sort of accident. Mm -hmm. But um, again, probably the ideal is not to store them for too long or yep. for, <laughs> keep them for 10 years in your shed. But also with batteries, like batteries, um, at the moment there's been quite a few incidences of um, rubbish trucks catching fire because especially things like computer batteries, when they get crushed, they can create, they can start a fire. And if that truck has, happens to have your old can of petrol as well, then it's, it adds to the danger. But um, like with with programs like B-Cycle, are really advising if you if you are disposing of batteries, put some tape over both terminals so that it can't actually spark with something else. So, so just put a bit of tape or something else over both ends and then, then take it to your recycling place or somewhere it can be re reused. But um, yeah, they, they do, they, they tend to be involved in a lot of um, a lot of transport fires at the moment. Um, batteries that are being recycled and processed or moved around and can cause fires, yeah. I had no idea. Um, they seem so benign, like we have them everywhere around the house and uh, we yeah. never think about, oh, this could actually cause a spark. Um, or a lot of the button batteries, if a pet or a child eats it, then it's mm. dangerous too, so. I, I have a jar of old batteries. Is that a terrible way to store them? Um, I mean to take them to like get recycled eventually, but it's you know. Probably safer than some options. Um, glass doesn't glass doesn't act as a conductor, so it's okay. not going to conduct to somewhere. But um, it's more likely you drop another battery in there and it's causing a bit of a shock and break the jar. But um, oh, okay. Probably often the best containers are cardboard or or, um, or plastic things like that. But um, the best thing is like there are now so many places we can take it to. Like you can take it to to Woolworths or to Office Works or to Aldi or to Bunnings or to a lot of those big places mm. now have battery cycling so you can go down, do your shopping, drop off your old plastic bags, drop off your batteries and keep it all under control. I've been meaning to take them to my local council for about a year. <laughs> it's just about actually doing it. It's always yeah. so hard to remember to do them. But that's why it's good now that the recycling of batteries is spreading out to all the supermarkets, a lot of supermarkets too and mm -hmm. um, even some of the Vinnie stores and s people are collecting batteries. so. So you don't have to go down to, to your council or somewhere specific. Yeah, oh, I'm just going to the supermarket. I'll take my bags. I'll take my batteries and mm -hmm. drop them off as part of your daily shopping rather yeah. than doing something totally different. Yeah. Yeah, definitely much uh, much easier. Store um, them right next to your, your shopping bags. So yeah. you take your shopping bag and your batteries. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> um, Actually, that comes down to household management where you put everything. So exactly. If you keep all your shopping bags, so you can make sure you've got your bag when you go to shopping. And everything else is miles away. You're not going to go, oh, I've got to go and find those batteries and those old plastic bags. If they're all in the same spot, you can grab the whole lot, get in the car and go. Good idea. Make a little um, leave the house stand with all the yeah. things you've got to take yeah. out. Um, so you did say to keep liquids down the bottom, but um, how do you prevent like kids or animals from, um, like kids, I know when I was a kid, I saw a bottle of Windex and I thought it was blue Coke. I thought it was a blue fizzy drink, so I drank it. I didn't, I didn't, you know, consume it. I like spat it out because I was like, "Ugh, this is didn't gross." Taste like Coke at all, didn't yeah. taste like any <laughs> anything I liked. But like, what do you? How do you stop kids from um, drinking stuff and like eating stuff? Yeah, again, that's um, part of the problem with storing. Like, the more you store things, the more they're likely to get into those. Um, but probably the main thing is to make sure they're in, in cupboards that are hard to open or stored in locations where the child is not likely to get to. So. Like if they're in your shed, if you can, keep the shed door shut or locked so that kids can't just wander in there or um, put them in areas where they can't reach. But also make sure that, like a lot of a lot of things like bleach come with childproof caps so you can, it's very hard for them to open them. So, so look for those sort of things too to make sure that you keep them as safe as possible. But um, like I know that 
like there's the, the Victorian Poisons Information Centre where if you ever do have any sort of poison, you can call them and they'll say, what did you, have you taken and this is what you should do. And they have a list of every year, there are thousands of calls they get about different chemicals and things that have caused poisonings. And nearly all of the things they get run about, rung about are things that we collect at Detox Your Home. So, so again, it's a matter of just looking at it and thinking, what, you know, do I want someone to be exposed to that or should I just get rid of it or, or make sure the cupboard is hard to open or mm. a lockable cupboard or something like that. So, so again, it's about making sure it's stored safely or just get it out if you don't, don't need it there anymore. Mm. And you also mentioned um, when you wash your car that all of the, um, yeah, all of the, you know, cleaning liquids and everything and the water goes down the stormwater drain. Um, would it be safer just in general to use things that are more like green safe, um, things that can, can go into the environment? Yeah, well, it's probably best, um, like if you wash your car on the, on the street where it's a hard surface, it'll flow down into the, the stormwater drain. Mm -hmm. It's often better to put your car on the nature strip where it's actually on the lawn because, um, and use pro products that aren't going to be toxic. So wash it on the lawn so the water actually goes into the, into the ground and possibly down into the water table too in terms of creating water as part of the natural water cycle, um, which means it's not going to flow straight into a, a waterway somewhere. It's going to be filtered by plants and things and make it safer, but also gets more water into the environment in that area, as long as you're not using really toxic products that are <laughs> going to kill off your grass and kill off everything else. So so look at what you are using in terms of the, the cleaning products about how safe they will be and then mm -hmm. try and watch, wash it somewhere where the water will be absorbed back mm -hmm. into the environment. And would you say that for like, you know, would you try and use a green product um, just in general for like cleaning your home or like um, shampoos and things? I'm not sure about anything like else, like paint or pesticides that are more sort of uh, less dangerous. Oh, there are some, there are different qualities of pesticides, like some are really toxic and you don't even want to touch them. And that's why they've got warnings over the bottle about wear gloves, wear respirators, wear everything else, because they are highly poisonous, whereas some are more organic like there's some that are some that are just forms of, of vinegar which will kill plants to a certain level like they're not going to wipe out things away that the really high toxic, highly toxic chemicals will but um they can be used for pest control so yeah do look for ones that are more safer and generally um often they'll be they'll have labels on them to describe why they're a safer option why they're safe for pets safe for the environment so read all the labels first and see what you're buying but um yeah i think um like we always think, okay, I've got weeds in my garden, what am I going to do? I'll just go and pour a whole lot of weed killer on them rather than going out there with the, the spade or the fork or the trowel and, and pulling the weeds out and putting them in the green bin so they go somewhere else and turn to the compost. So it's, um, it's about how we choose to, to respond to those things, whether we are, or do want a quick and easy solution, which is to poison them, mm. which works temporarily because as soon as that's done, some, another weed will grow back in the same spot or whether you, you maintain your garden. or um, And paints, there are different different qualities of paint too, like some with really high levels of um, organic compounds that can off-gas, whereas others are quite um, designed not to produce lots of toxic gas and mm -hmm. have different different types of paint here. So so certainly talk to the paint manuf or your paint shop and say, look, I want a, a paint that's not too toxic or too poisonous, and they'll be able to point you in the direction of all the, the right ones to choose, yeah. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I guess I'd never thought about you know, seeing what I'm buying and, you know, I just thought, oh, it's just cleaning stuff. I'm just going to buy yeah. cleaning stuff um, or I'm just going to buy fertilizer. I'm just going to buy all these different things. Um, I guess now I'll, I'll, yeah, put some more consideration into that. Well, it's like a lot of people now are starting to look at the labels of the food they buy and think, should I be putting that in my body? <clears throat> like I, I know at work years ago, excuse me. <clears throat> Did you want some water? No, I'm right. Okay. Uh, at work years ago, we, as part of a program, we were working with a group of kids who created a time capsule that they wanted us to open in five years' time. When we opened it, we thought, oh, what's this? Oh, there's a, there's a burger in here. And we opened the cheeseburger. I won't say, say who it's from, but um, it was totally intact, like it hadn't gone mouldy. It wasn't. It looked like you could put it in the microwave and eat it straight away. I was thinking, wow, this is what we eat when we buy those burgers. And so a lot of people are starting to think about what you buy when you, when you buy a product and you can eat that. But... Um, a lot of the other things we buy, we just get oh, cleaning product. I'll just buy that and I'll scrub away and never think about what that's going to do in terms of what it leaves on the surface you've just cleaned or where it goes when you're finished or just what, what sort of gases come off from it. Yeah, so it's definitely worth all those other products having a look at the label and think, is that something that, something that I want to actually use in my home? And also, what am I going to do with it afterwards if I've got half a bottle left? 
can I put it in the bin or do, am I going to have to find some other way to, to get rid of it? Mm. So um, what's something that you do in your own home to like keep everything organised? Do you just yeah. not buy um, toxic things and you just have an all-natural household? Not quite, but we don't tend to buy a lot of things like that. Like we, we buy soap, we buy detergent, we buy laundry detergent. Um, we do have a few cans of paint in the shed that I'm just about to get rid of, but yeah, we tend not to buy a lot of toxic stuff. Um, like even weed killer, we we had some in the shed years ago, and we kept thinking, oh, why did we buy that for? And finally managed to take that to a detox home event and get rid of it. But um, yeah, we tend, tend to avoid buying a lot of those things and think, right, if something's not meant to be there, we'll pull it out, we'll weed around it, and we'll maintain the garden rather than trying to just spray the whole lot and get rid of it. Um, partly because we have a, a big veggie garden too, like we don't want to think that all the other things that we've put in there are going to end up in our food. Um, but I think mostly we, we tend to not buy a lot of those things, but also things like the batteries, we just do take them back to back to one of the recycling points. We have a big bag full of every plastic bag we use goes into that. When we go to the supermarket, we take our bags and put them in the, the recycling bag there. Yeah, so is that something that is that something that you that you do like you know once a week or once a month that you go through and organise everything? Um, do you have a set time, or is it just whenever it sort of starts getting when out it gets of control? too full? Um, <laughs> so we just whenever we take a bag to the supermarket, get rid of all the plastic bags, we just hang another one where that had been, and every time we get a plastic bag, it just goes it goes in that larger bag until it's full, and then when it's overflowing, we go, oh, I've got to get rid of these bags, and so we we'll take them all down there and then get rid of them. Mm-hmm. So it's more just a, we just put it in a place where it's convenient, so that we don't have to hunt around for the spot to put the bags and becomes really obvious when they're overflowing so we go, oh, okay right i'll take that to the supermarket now mm-hmm. yeah and um and it just does that help you just to you know keep your household nice and organized and i wouldn't say the rest of the house was organized but it does <laughs> does <laughs> does manage that that particular area so it does help us recycle those but mm-hmm. we also have the recycling bin in the kitchen so everything goes straight in there mm-hmm. and again with that like we whenever we finish with something we think not like often people put things in the recycling that they finished with in the kitchen, so yoga contain yoga contains things like that, but um, they might have finished with a shampoo bottle or something else in somewhere else in the house and they they don't think is that recyclable. So we try and just make sure whenever we've emptied something, we think is this recyclable first before we chuck it into one of the bins. It's so tempting to put your shampoo bottles in the normal bin because you've got to walk halfway across the house. Yeah. That, that that's what I find at least. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Um, it's true, yeah, and it's yeah. just not something people normally think about. They mm. they see it as, as kitchen waste, as recyclable rather than all these other things, yeah. Mm. When actually I, th- I find it's quite easy just to clean the shampoo bottles and everything because it's shampoo, you just kind of shake it out. Yeah. Whereas yogurt, you've got to actually scrub out. Um, so do you recommend this to everyone? The um, Yeah, um, how, you know, keeping your house, how you keep your house organised. I think so, yeah. It's, mm-hmm. The aim is to make it simple so that mm-hmm. it's not not becoming an effort that wherever you tend to most like be nice likely to fix, finish with a plastic bag, store them there so you can put them in that, that corner or in that bag and then just remind yourself to take them to the supermarket. So mm. it's, a, it's really about thinking about how do you make it most convenient. Uh, so we've also got some questions from the audience. That's good. Um, so the, the first question is, uh, what is the best way to manage, manage the disposal of toxic waste? Uh, probably the best way to manage it is to first of all, um, First of all, buy as little as possible. So do look at the labels, think about how toxic is this? Do I need it? And if you do need it, because there are some things we have to have, like if you've got a, a petrol lawn mower, you need petrol to run it and you might mow the lawn irregularly and it might just sit there for a long time and you get to the point where it's not going to be good for your lawn mower, so you, you may have to dispose of it. So there are there are things we have to buy um, or choose to buy. But um, first of all, think about how much am I going to need and buy buy what you need rather than the 20-litre bottle because it's cheap. Mm-hmm. And... Um, if you can buy the least toxic option, but whenever you're buying it, to think when am I, when I'm finished with this, how am I going to get rid of it? So that should be part of your buying process, and then um, at the end, look for things like detox your home, or pretty much every council in Australia has some sort of system for hazardous household waste. So just go to your council website and look for household chemicals or something like that, and they'll tell you what you can do with them. Mm. So just do plan as part of your buying process that somehow I'm probably going to have to get rid of some of this at some point, and how am I going to do that? Something that I do as well is, um, I mean, I'm lucky I've got family close by to me. So if I don't need a lot of something, I will ask them if they have it. Yeah. yeah. I need a little bit of glue. Does anyone have some glue? 
and then I'll use that first before purchasing something. Or if I know that I need to buy something, I might see if anyone else needs in the family needs that before I dispose of it. Um, so rather than you know throwing out half a bottle, you throw out a quarter of a bottle. Yeah, which is great. It's just that, mm. that shared community where you buy something for everyone and, and use what you need rather than mm -hmm. buying having, having a big bottle sitting in your shed and someone else is going, oh, I just need a little bit of that stuff and mm. they have to go and buy another big bottle too. So Yeah, plus it's yeah. cheaper. Yeah, and it means you get to see your family, your friends. You go and drop it off or they come and see you and so it's mm -hmm. a good social thing as well. Yeah. yeah, and, you know, you reciprocate. So, you know, you borrow some fertiliser from one friend and then they borrow some... I don't know, power tools or petrol or something because their car's broken down. <laughs> All those, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Certainly, yeah, just always think about how you can share and, and get the best mm. value out of what you buy, yeah. So question number two is, what is the negative impact of storing toxic household items for too long? Um, yeah, probably the main thing, the negative impact is... Um, we often get people who ring us and say, oh, look, have you got a detox your home event coming? I'm moving in two weeks' time and have to get rid of all the stuff, like... When you move, you realise there's all these things you have to get rid of and some of them are not easy to dispose of properly at all. So you may have to wait several months for an event to come up where you can get rid of it easily. So the fact that you've got it sitting there and suddenly have to get rid of it, that can be quite a problem. But um, also people need more space and they say, oh, I've had a big clean out. And, and so it's taking up space, it's taking up room and um, it's often it's, it's, it's something that you're probably not going to use again. So it's just taking up unnecessary space and becomes a problem after a while and... Yeah, they're the main, main concerns with it and the, the possibility of it being somehow linked to some sort of poisoning of, of a child or an animal or something like that or being spilt into your garden and you, mean you can't grow something in that part of the garden. Yes, that would be annoying to have this like one patch of just like veggie patch where nothing grows. It's really interesting because we were looking at getting chooks a while ago and we, I got a couple of books about um, making sure you set up well for, for having chooks and first one of them said was make sure you test the soil around where you're going to keep the chooks because they're going to dig up on that dirt and get your soil tested make sure you test all the soil along the side the, along your fence line because that's where people pour stuff <laughs> and so, oh. so people and I, I remember this as a child my dad saying like had something we had to get rid of and dad said oh, just put it down the back of the fence we don't grow anything there and that's what we do we'd just go down to the back fence and pour it along the fence line and we never grew anything there because we knew what was in that soil but um when you move into a place that hasn't been yours for a long time, you think, oh, look, it looks great. I'll put my chooks over there and they start digging around and they eat whatever is in that dirt. That, so it's, um, yeah, it can be quite a problematic thing, the, the fact that we often do think about pouring things along the fence line or people say to us, oh, yeah, I've, I've always just dug a hole and put this stuff in the, in the hole. Is that all right? Go, no, it's not really. Like, it's still poisonous, even though it's dug in a hole in the ground and you're going to grow things there. So it's... Um. How do you keep? Tr I mean, this is not a question for you. This is for the question. This is a question for people who are digging holes. How do you keep track of where you've dug stuff, and know not to grow things there? That's the problem. Often you don't know. You've got yeah. no idea. Yeah. People might remember where they buried their pet, but yeah. all the other things that people bury in, in different places, they often have no idea. Or we did recently get some information from stuff from one of our, our events. We're talking to somebody. They said that. Um, they always, whenever they wash their bike, they collect all the chemicals they used to wash their bike and pour it on a certain spot in the driveway because that's where the car parks and there's always oil dropped off the car and so they pour it in the one spot. But, so some people are methodical and they know they've done that, but when they move, the next piece of people who move it in don't know where that spot was or where the spot around the garden was that somebody's buried something. So it's, it's not as though you, you move into a property and someone gives you a map of all the toxic spots around your backyard. It's just something that, it's not good for you or for the other people who move in after you like an anti-tox it's like an anti-treasure map yes yeah <laughs> don't plant here yeah <laughs> um what is so the third question is what is the appropriate disposal method um for lead contaminated products especially around children um is this paints or other things i suppose it's what well, it says lead contaminated children's products but i don't know oh, that's probably things that have been painted with with lead mm. lead based paints um Probably the first thing is make sure, we'll try not to have them in the first place because lead is quite toxic and children, the first thing they do is they, they bite everything, they lick everything and, and they'll absorb that lead, which can be quite quite problematic. But um, probably the safest way to dispose of those, um, oh, there's too many ways. Um, yeah, a lot of them, if, if it's wooden toys and things like that, like 
there's probably no real preferred option. The best prop thing that it's it's best that they are destroyed in some way, whether it's to go to landfill or to um, find some other option. Which there there aren't many options around, I don't think. But certainly get them out of the house and don't don't let any kids have them, or certainly don't let them put them in their mouth. Mm. You can actually buy lead testing kits from from places like Bunnings, where you can. Any painted surface you can test to see whether it actually contains lead. So you could test your children's toys as well as um, the the paint on the, the house walls and things like that too. But certainly, it's certainly good to not to have those in the first place. So try and try and not buy things like that. But also let your friends know when they're buying things overseas, especially try not to buy things with paint that may be lead containing. Yeah. Mm. Um, so question number four is: How do I d- identify a potentially dangerous product? Often it'll tell you on the label. So first of all, read the labels to see what it actually is. Um, if it's not something you're familiar with, maybe do a quick web search. Um, often the most dangerous things are something where somebody's used something, they've decided they want to save a bit and they put it in another bottle and they put it in the shed. So you've got a, a bottle of some strange liquid in the shed that you don't know what it is. And So if you don't know what it is, it's probably just consider it to be dangerous. Don't, don't use it for anything. Um, but yeah, I'd start with most things, read the label first. And if it's got a brand name on it, if there's not detail on the the actual product do a web search to find out what it is um a lot of chemicals too if you especially when they're being used commercially they have what's called a material safety data sheet that comes with it which will tell you what the poison is or what the the product is and what to do if you happen to accidentally swallow it or get in your eyes so generally generally the labels are, are good about those sort of things um and if it's not labelled food, don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good yep. um, rule of life. Excellent. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to have the open mic. So this is where you can talk about um, anything you're sort of interested interested in. Do you have any ideas? Uh, yeah, the um, Jawbone Marine Sanctuary. Uh-huh, go ahead. Which is, um, it's a small sanctuary just outside Melbourne in, in, uh, at Williamstown. It's about 35 hectares of... Uh, marine area which was declared as a marine sanctuary coming up to 20 years ago now and um, so it's, it's quite an amazing spot where you can walk straight off the shore into the water there's plenty of fish to swim around it's a great snorkeling spot or diving spot for people who want to get out and see a broad range of, of marine animals living in, living in the bay um, it's also a place where a lot of schools go there and kids spend the day learning about about both the um, things living in the sand or on the shore and the, the, the plant life there but also uh, we've had a few events where we actually have an organisation come and teach the kids to snorkel. So kids will come down and we'll get them in the water and teach them how to snorkel. And it's amazing, like they'll come back and you go, how are you going there? Oh, I saw a fish. <laughs> These kids are so <laughs> excited that for the first time in their life, they've put a mask on and put their face in the water and had a look around and seen things they didn't even imagine existed or that they'd ever come across. And so it's quite, it's quite an amazing spot where if you ever want to just go for a swim or go and see some amazing marine life, go down to Jawbone Marine Sanctuary and um, maybe look look for our website too because I'm part of a friends group there where we do a lot, run a lot of activities. Um, some quite mundane things like Clean of Australia Day, we go and pick up rubbish, um, but also things like the Great Victorian Fish Count where people come down and we'll spend an hour or so in the water where everyone counts and identifies as many fish as they can so we can see really the broad range of species that are in the bay, but also how that's changing over time too. So we've been doing it for about 12 years now. And with climate changes, as species move around, you can see some small changes happening. So that's part of that sort of ongoing citizen science, just seeing what's out there. And um, we go and count sea slugs as well, which are um, also called nudibranchs. They're quite amazing. They look like slugs, but they have incredibly bright colors and amazing shapes. So once a year we go out and count all those too. So it's quite a fun place to go. and a good community activity to be involved in and be part of helping look after a place like that and to really appreciate this amazing marine sanctuary right on our doorstep here in Melbourne. I had no idea there was a marine sanctuary in Melbourne. There's actually two. There's another one. Um, well, the, the next closest one is at Ricketts Point um, down on the bay, down there, down around Brighton area. Oh. There's a really good cafe there too. Like A lot of people go there for the cafe and then find the marine sanctuary afterwards. But um, it's also a site with a lot of... Um, there's a lot of fossils have been found around there, so they've got a small uh, marine science education area. We can go and see the fossils that have been found, but also with their friends group, they'll take you out on snorkeling activities and have a look around and see some of the, the again, amazing marine life out there. So there's at least a couple within fairly reasonable distance from the CBD where you can go and have a snorkel and have a dive if you know how to do that and have a look around, yeah. That's so cool. I had no idea. I'm going to 
check both of those out because I actually go to both areas re relatively regularly. Yeah. Yeah, do, yeah, just go and check yeah. it out and enjoy it. Yeah. Mm. Um, and sea slugs. I've never seen a sea slug, so I have to go to go see one. Go to Google and look for sea slugs or nudibranchs, and you'll be amazed at what they look like. Okay. They're quite incredible animals like that. Nudibranch means it's got the gills on the outside, so it's it's outside breathing from its body. So, um, like they they look like a slug with these bright, almost sail-like attachments on them, which are their gills, which they so they absorb oxygen from the water through these attachments so that mm -hmm. sort of straight in the water instead of like a fish will pump water in through its gills to get oxygen coming through its gills, whereas the nudibranch just has them all on the outside of their body and just absorbing oxygen from the water through these these external gills they're, just hanging out they are and they're incredibly bright colored like really wow. bright reds and yellows and stuff yeah amazing um so if people want to find out more about the sanctuary where should they go uh go to the end of rifle range drive at uh in williamstown that, that that's where it is so uh -huh. just go down to the end of rifle range drive which is part of the reason why it's a sanctuary because for 110 years there's a rifle range there which um meant nobody could go in there and go fishing without accidentally being shot, which happened a couple of times. <laughs> uh, but it was protected for that reason, But it was, and it's also um, protected because it's a, an area with uh, white mangroves growing on the basalt rock, which is quite unusual for, for Victoria. So, so that's where they can find it, but they can also just go to, um, just do a search for Jawbone Marine Sanctuary and you'll find a website and a lot of information from Parks Victoria as well. Great, and um, what if they want to find out more about you or your um, organization um, go to the sustainability victoria website and uh, when they first go to the sustainability victoria website there's a couple of programs that will come up um, once with, with a few questions like how do i safely dispose of chemicals or um, which takes you to the detox your home program and another one about schools and education which takes you to the resource smart schools program which i've worked out with quite a lot as well where we work with schools to help them build sustainability into not just what they teach about but how they operate too so the schools create vegetable gardens and things where the, the students are actually involved in some aspects of growing gardens but also indigenous planting and things and um, a whole range of activities that the students do to make the school more sustainable so check out both those programs great i will um and we'll put um yeah details for both of those in our show notes so you can find them um thank you david for joining me today no worries thanks for inviting us in here it's always good to talk about these esoteric things like household chemicals and what to do with them and <laughs> things nobody else thinks about but that's what we have to think about so that we can help people get rid of them mm, thank you thank you you've been listening to on the house produced by the household management science labs a division of lmsl the life management science labs more episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching lmsl on apple podcasts google podcasts Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel, as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, hm.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.